Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Open Mic here on my YouTube channel. I'm, of course, your host, John Campia, and this is the daily show we do Monday through Friday, just taking open conversation about movies and movie news, and it's good to have you guys here. We're going to be taking a whole bunch of your live questions here today, but also I'm going to be taking some questions that were sent in earlier today on the John Campia Show, and a couple that were left over from Open Mic the other day, just to make sure that I get caught up in those, because I always want to make sure we get all the questions that people send in. And I want to say hello to Rose Ryan, Molly, who's in the chat board, Adamus, who's in the chat board. There's already a whole ton of you guys in there. So a special hello to all of you guys. And uh, let's have a good time talking about some movies today. Okay. With all that out of the way, let's get into the first stuff today. These are live questions that came in a little bit earlier today. The first one comes to us from Hawker Walks writes, have you had a chance to see Ingrid Goes West? I thought Aubrey Plaza... Uh, could have been nominated for Best Actress. I don't know about that. Um, I thought she was very good. I thought Aubrey Plaza was very good. I thought Elizabeth Olsen was very good. I thought O'Shea Jackson was really good in it. But I don't quite see... I No, I don't think she could have been nominated for Best Actress. The movie's great and all that kind of stuff. And she was great in it. Really good performances across the board. It's a very good movie. Me, personally, I don't see how she could have gotten nominated for Best Actress. Not when you take into consideration all the actresses that did. Like, Aubrey Plaza's performance, in my opinion at any rate, wasn't better than any of the other actresses who got nominated. But it certainly was good. Oh, and by the way, a couple of people in the board are asking about um, why is the show early today? The show is early today because... We are now moving open mic. I've gotten a few requests from people because of the time zone difference asking if I can move open mic a little bit earlier. So I'm going to experiment doing it at 2 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. That's 5 p.m. East Coast time and whatever o'clock in the country that you live in. So I'm going to try it doing a little bit earlier uh, for the next couple of weeks and see how this works at 2 o'clock. So that's why that's happening today. All right. Next one comes to us from Trent Stewart who writes, Child of the 80s, I sat horrified at the movies when Optimus Prime was killed. It was never the same after that. If the MCU kills icons Tony and Cap, does the balloon start to burst for Marvel? That is actually an argument I have made before. That, look what happened to Transformers when they just started killing off major people. The popularity of Transformers tanked for a while. However, there is one big difference. In that Transformers movie, they didn't just kill Optimus Prime. They killed all the Autobots and almost all the Decepticons. They killed them all, except <clears throat> I think for Jazz, I think Jazz survived, Bumblebee survived, and I think that's it. All of the original Generation 1 Autobots were killed in like five minutes Boom. Hey, kitties, you know all these toys you've collected and loved all the years? Yeah, they're all dead now. Time for you to buy the new toys. That pissed me off. Even as a kid, that pissed me off. So that is a different situation than, say, if they killed off Cap or Tony. And I don't think they're going to kill off Cap or Tony. But if they did, it's not the same unless they killed all the Avengers. Like, if they killed Cap, Tony, Thor, Hawkeye, Black Widow... Um, and every and Falcon, everybody else that is a G1, if you will, Avenger, then it's the same. Because they didn't just kill Optimus. It wasn't just killing Optimus that killed the enthusiasm for the brand. It's that they killed everybody, which was a big mistake. Uh, interesting observation, though, Trent. All right. Next one comes to us from Geek Out Loud, who writes, All villains are conservative capitalists. Nothing to do with gay marriage you are straw manning excuses, Hollywood. You're making it about homophobia. Get out of here. Just, no. It's, just get out of here. Um, let's see. Daryl Best Wadley writes, have you ever seen the movie Three Ninjas? Oh, yeah, with the kids and the grandfathers, like a ninjutsu, and he's like trained them during the, yeah, I did. It, it was corny and fun and all that kind of stuff. This, I, I've got some friends of mine who just think that that's classic. And it's, no, it's not. It's, I mean, it's cool if you believe it's a classic, and if it's a classic to you, that's great, but I, I yeah, you know, I'll, I'll disagree on that. It's fun, it's cheesy, but I'll leave it at that. Um, Harsh writes, hey, John, big fan from India. Do you think Black Panther can stay at number one for the fourth weekend? I think it will be close between Black Panther and A Wrinkle in Time. I think it's got a good chance of beating Wrinkle in Time. I put up my review for Wrinkle in Time a little bit earlier today. Not a very good movie. Um, I don't think word of mouth is going to be great. I think Disney knew it wasn't a very good movie because 
they held the review embargo until like 36 hours before the film opened to the public, which is not normal for Disney to do. Um, so I've got a feeling Black Panther, you see, because they were originally projecting about $38 million for a wrinkle in time. And I think 38 to $40 million would beat Black Panther. But I don't think it's going to get 38 to 40 million. I think it's going to come in around maybe 30 million dollars and Black Panther will just eke it out. So I think Black Panther will win the weekend again. I think. Um, let's see. Dave um, Tapia writes, Hey John, big fan. Would you buy the four, the 4K digital if it was available? The 4K digital of what? I have no idea. Um, but just let me say this in general since I don't even know what movie we're talking about. Uh, no, I wouldn't buy the 4K digital. I get all my movies now. I get all my movies on streaming. I, I very, very, very rarely buy physical media anymore. So probably not. Uh, let's see. Chris Martin writes, have you seen the Snow White live at Radio City Music Hall from the from 1980? It's on VHS. <laughs> that, whoa, that is a deep cut, Chris. That's a deep cut. No, I have not seen that. Uh, I, I'm not even really familiar with it at all. So, no, I have not seen the 1980 live from Radio City Music Hall version of Snow White. I haven't seen it. It must be good if you're talking about it, but I, I've never even heard of it personally. Super points to you guys if you have heard of it and seen it there. Uh Brian T. Brawler writes, John, how old is Jim Cummings? I believe Jim Cummings is 50, 66. I believe Jim Cummings is 66. Jim Cummings, for those of you who don't know, he's the guy who does the voice of Winnie the Pooh. Um, but he was also the voice of, oh, damn it, who was he? The, he was the voice of uh, um, Holdo in, um, in Star Wars Rebels. And so, yeah, so he's a classic guy, but he's also the voice of Winnie the Pooh, and he's doing the voice of Winnie the Pooh in the new Christopher Robin movie, which is amazing. But yes, I believe he is 66 years old. Um, Nathan Lip writes, do you think Daniel Day-Lewis is really going to retire? It looks like it. I mean, look, I take it with a grain of salt whenever any celebrity says they're retiring. Because very rarely does it actually stick. But considering, consider this. Daniel Day-Lewis was only making a movie every two, three, four years. So it's not like he was, it's not like he's one of these guys who's got the bug and he just has to act and he's always got to be acting. And you see that with some people who do like two, three movies a year. Daniel Day-Lewis is doing a movie like every three or four years. So I, if he's saying he's retiring, I, I think I kind of buy it. I think it's sad. I hope he's lying. I hope he's just like, or I hope he changes his mind, but I think he's done. Um, Lance Pro 85 writes, Hey John, is the production of video games and films comparable to one another or are they completely different? Well, look, I've never worked in the video game industry. I know some friends who have. My understanding is that they're very, very, very different. Um, it's more akin to what would be more like, I don't even know what to compare it to, but from my understanding, which is limited, because like I said, I've never worked in the video game industry. But from the people I've talked to, it, it sounds like it's a considerably different process and a considerably di different mechanism uh, from that of movies. So I think it's probably pretty different. Uh, D. Walthers writes, John, uh, this guy, Nathan, sent you a $200 by accident. Yes, earlier today, I think somebody meant to type in a super chat and just sometimes on some things online, if you want to type $2, you got to hit 200 for the cents, right? I have a feeling this person who sent in a super chat today for 200 bucks probably hit 200 and then just hit send without actually looking. Um, but I wrote into them, said, hey, look, um, that happened to somebody else before that they accidentally sent in like $500 once. And I pointed them to YouTube and they were able to get it worked out with YouTube to get that uh, withdrawn. So I, I gave that, I, I mentioned that on the chat board. I said, hey, tell the guy to do this. Hopefully he's able to correct that, that mistake. Uh, Bennett Tompkins writes, Ant-Man is on the Infinity War poster. He's just too tiny to see. Yeah, that was funny because earlier today on the John Campia show, we were talking about um, the new posters that came out for Avengers Infinity War. And we mentioned that there was a couple of people noticeable by their absence. Number one is Hawkeye. Number two is Ant-Man. And so then somebody else pointed out, and John knows too that Black Panther isn't there either. You know why I didn't notice that Black Panther was missing? Because he's featured so, like, Black Panther is featured more prominently 
in the Avengers Infinity War trailer than just about anybody else. I think he has more lines of dialogue than anybody else in the trailer. So I didn't even, I wasn't even looking for him to have a poster, but that's true too. He didn't have a poster either. So nice joke, Bennett. Nice joke. Um, okay. Guys, now I'm going to go over to the live questions. A lot of you guys have been sending in live questions. You're watching live right now. I'm going to go to that and take that. But before I do, I just want to give a little plug here for my Patreon campaign. Of course, guys, do me a favor. If you're somebody who enjoys my content and you enjoy watching my programming, do me a favor. Head on over to www.patreon.com slash John Campia. There, you'll get all the information you need about what it means to be a Patreon supporter, how being a Patreon supporter keeps my shows on the air, and what benefits there are to being a Patreon supporter. And then maybe you'll be a Patreon supporter too, which would just be dandy if you did. Uh, and of course, if you don't, no problem. I'm just happy you're here being a film fan with us. That's the most important thing. Okay, let's now go over to the live questions. For those of you guys who are in the chat board right now and talking live, Let's get to this. All right. In the live things, we've got this. Rodrigo Ortiz writes, oh, so this is what it feels like. Logan, man tears. I mean, it was such a great moment. I mean, I think most of us knew going into Logan that Logan was probably going to die, that Wolverine was probably going to die in Logan. So I think all of us, to some degree, were a little prepared for that, but it didn't matter. When that moment comes and he says, this is what it feels like, there's something sad in that too. Like it's not a triumph. It's something sad in that. Maybe a regret of how many people he's killed. Um, maybe it's something he never thought he'd get to experience. I don't know. But I, it, you're right. It was a it was a chest pounding kind of moment. It's like, goodbye, Wolverine. You're right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Juna uh, Timioja writes... Greetings from Finland. Greeting. You guys have a great hockey program over in Finland. Favorite movie of 2018 so far. All right. My favorite movie of 2018 so far is not Black Panther. Black Panther would be my number two favorite movie of the year so far. My favorite movie of the year so far, if I'm going to be brutally honest, is Paddington 2. It just is. Paddington 2 is my favorite movie of the year so far. I think it's the best movie of the year so far. I really do. Uh, Black Panther would come in number two for me. And then there's not a whole lot else to talk about this year, but I mean, Paddington 2 is the number one all-time critically rated film on Rotten Tomatoes. Not that that means everything, but it, I just, I smiled like an idiot from the beginning to end of that movie. So yes, right now we're early in the year, but right now my favorite film of 2018 is Paddington 2 at the moment. All right. Let's see. Uh, Chris Martin says, favorite MCU origin story, Captain America. That, it's just a great story. His whole beginnings from being the skinny little guy with all the courage and all the heart and all the, you know, the, the moral compass and the moral North Star that Steve Rogers was, who was then given that power by that doctor who was looking for somebody worthy to give it to. And then, you know, being frozen in time as a hero coming out today, now being a fish out of water. There's that Captain America story, at least as they are portrayed in the MCU so far. That Captain America story to me is just ace. Just aces. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. So that is still my favorite one to date so far. All right, let's move on. Next question comes to us from Chris Martin, who writes, John, I just looked at the Black Panther hot toy. I need that. Also, Emperor Palpatine Return of the Jedi. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, that one... That one's damn deadly. That was de damn de deadly. Um, let me see if I can pull up the Black Panther hot toy uh, so you guys can see what it is we're talking about here. And I can bring it up because it does look all kinds of spectacular. Um, dear heavens, these look really good. Yeah, these look great. I'm gonna, I'm so, oh, nuts. It's not letting me... Mm, uh, you know what? Look it up yourself. You'll find them. You're right. The Black Panther one looks amazing. I know I'm going to be spending some of my money on that, unfortunately. Money I don't have. I'm going to be spending money on that for sure. It looked, the detailing is so cool. The character is so cool. Even the body, when you get those close-up shots of the Black Panther uh, hot toy, you get really tight into there. Even the, the texture on the body armor is just so good. The poses, the articulation is fantastic. The face looks amazing. 
it's just such a great... Now, I don't have a whole ton of hot toys. You can see I've got a few of them back there, but I think... I think this T'Challa one is going to be the next on my list. I think this T'Challa one will be the next hot toy that goes up on my list. Then after that, I'm going to be looking for Thanos, apparently. Uh, all right. Dominic Davis writes, Opinion on if they should do a Transformers reboot. Yes. Yeah, I completely believe. Transformers are a fantastic property. They're iconic. They have great nostalgia value. There's great mythology to them. Unfortunately, they've kind of run it into the ground. Start again. Reboot. I feel the same way about it as I do about the DCEU. You've got these iconic characters, amazing mythology, worthy history. Reboot it. Okay, it hasn't worked. It hasn't gone the way. It hasn't come anywhere near its potential. So reboot it, start again and go. So I definitely feel that way about Transformers. And I believe you could succeed. So I think after this Bumblebee movie, wait three years and launch a new movie in three years. Totally rebooting the franchise, and you're good to go. And I think it could be incredibly successful. I think you put it in the hands of somebody who's going to respect the... It uh, doesn't have to be somebody who grew up as a Transformers fan, but knows to come to it with a sense of respect for the source material. Make changes to it, bring it up to the modern day, and make a killer movie. You do that, I think Transformers... Look, pieces of crap Transformers movies we're getting, like, we're making a billion dollars. Imagine what a great Transformers movie will make. Just, it's staggering. So yes, I'm absolutely all for a Transformers reboot if that's what they do. Fingers crossed. All right, Matthew uh, Coase writes, um, love that Zeb and Callus become a gay couple at the end of Rebels, Star Wars, Beauty and the Beast. Well, no, I never, I never got the implication that they were gay at the end. I just got that they were best friends and they brought them there. But hey, if that's your interpretation of it, who's to say you're wrong? But that, that's not what I got out of it. Um, Adamus95 writes, uh, let's see. Hey, John, love watching your content. Well, thank you so much, Adamus. I uh, wanted to ask, with all the remakes we get, are you surprised we never got a Jaws remake? Keep up the great work. Well... I'm not totally surprised about it because you know, we've seen another a number of other studios take shots at shark movies and not had great success other than Sharknado. And you know what? The very fact that Sharknado is a part of our popular pop culture um, dictionary now maybe might even deter them even more from doing a Jaws remake. Like, is now the whole idea of a shark movie considered laughable because of Sharknado? I don't know. Then you had Deep Blue Sea. Um, which, hey, I got nothing against LL Cool J as a, uh, as a chef. Um, man, that death scene of Samuel Jackson in Deep Blue Sea is still one of the most shocking moments ever of any film. Um, but it just feels like the value of a shark movie has been eroded over the years to the point that maybe they don't feel like doing it. Or maybe it's just that Jaws is considered such a classic that, you know, it's a matter of nobody in Hollywood wants to piss off Steven Spielberg. And because Steven Spielberg is one of the more powerful people in Hollywood and nobody wants to piss him off. And if he doesn't want somebody remaking Jaws, ain't nobody going to remake Jaws. As long as Steven, and I don't know that this is the case, by the way, I'm just speculating here, but if Steven Spielberg doesn't want somebody to remake Jaws, ain't nobody putting up the money for somebody to remake Jaws if Steven Spielberg's not behind it. So now nah, for all those reasons, all those possibilities, all those theories, I'm not really surprised they haven't done one. Look, I think there will be a Jaws remake at some point. I do, but it, it might be a while and would need Steven Spielberg to give it his blessing. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, Luis Blanco writes, it was cool to see my home country of Bolivia mentioned throughout the most recent Lucifer episode. Thoughts on this week's episode. I have not seen this week's episode yet because Anne and I weren't home and I watched that show with Anne and we haven't had a night to watch TV together yet. Like last night we had an evening together, but we ended up going to a wrinkle in time screening tonight. She's got her Dungeons and Dragons game. So I'm, we're not gonna be able to watch it tonight. I'm hoping tomorrow night we'll be able to watch it. But I watch some shows without Anne, but Luc there's a couple of shows, and Lucifer is one of them, that we don't watch without the other. And Lucifer is one of those. And we just haven't had the chance to do it yet. So 
I I get frustrated when I have to wait to watch Lucifer because I absolutely love that show. Okay, let's move on here. Chris Martin uh, writes, any news on Zootopia 2? Not that I've heard. And here's the funny thing too. I'm not really looking forward to it. Look, I'm one of these guys where I liked Zootopia. I thought it was a good movie. I gave it a review. I gave it a thumbs up. But I did not nearly think it was, it was as good as a lot of people out there felt it was. There are people out there who just... Zootopia became one of their all-time favorite animated films. And that's great. More power to them. That's wonderful. To me, it was a better than average, uh, quite quite a, quite a bit better than average, but it was a better than average animated film. It was enjoyable. It was fun. I, I didn't personally sense any kind of degree of real specialness about it, like you get in like an Up or in The Incredibles or something like that. But um, to a lot of people, it was just like I said, some people consider it one of their favorite animated films of all time now. Not so much for me, and since it's not so much for me, I haven't really been keeping my ear to the ground about the development process of Zootopia 2. I know they're going to make it. Like, that much we all know. But as far as when they might do it, where it is in the process, what steps they've taken so far, I'm not really sure yet. I haven't heard anything. If you guys have heard anything, by all means, find a link to the news and share it in the comments section below for all the other viewers. That would be great. All right, let's move on now. Uh, oops, and I lost, where did we go? Do, 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 whole bunch more questions came in. Uh, here we go. Anthony Cullen writes, uh, you think they, okay, Anthony writes, you think they hinted a future Ezra slash Sabine romance? Well, I mean, we're talking about Star Wars Rebels for those you don't know. They hinted at an Ezra Sabine romance since episode one, season one. I mean, they've been hinting at that since the beginning of the show. So it wasn't just at the end of the show. I believe, yes, they, the entire series was hinting at the notion of an Ezra and Sabine romance. Now I've already recorded it. I'm just going to upload it after we're done open mic today, but I've got a video going up called star Wars rebels, the finale, why I loved it and hated it. <laughs> why I both loved and hated the Rebels finale. There's a bunch of things in it I thought were great, but there were a few things in it that I absolutely detested. Something about Ezra is one of those things. So I will upload that video as soon as we're done the uh, open mic show here today. All right. Next up, uh, Luke writes, what is your favorite movie gun? Robocop 4 for me. I think it's um, Predator, Jesse the Body Ventura, Old Painless. I believe that was the name of his gun, Old Painless. The big, the big uh, uh, cannon. Yeah, I believe Jesse the Body Ventura referred to it as Old Painless. I loved, I mean, he's, he's kind of crazy, but I love Jesse the Body's character in that movie. Ain't got time to bleed. I mean, come on, Jesse the Body Ventura and Old Painless. So I think that would probably, so that would be my favorite gun. Next up would probably be Han Solo's blaster. Totally iconic. Totally and completely iconic, uh, his blaster. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to stick with Old Painless. The Robocop gun's a really good pick, though. That's a great pick. All right, next up is Ben Corcoran, who writes, When was the last ban bad Daniel Day-Lewis film? Uh, what was the name of it? He was great in it, but I believe it was called... Was it called Nine? Hold on a second. Let me look it up. Daniel Day Lewis. It was, there's one where he played like um, this film producer or this film director. Let me just look it up here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In 2009's, uh, he played Guido Cantina in nine. Was not thrilled with that movie. I'll be honest with you. Was not thrilled. Now, of course, Daniel Day Lewis gives a great performance because he's Daniel Day Lewis and he's the greatest actor of all time. But you didn't ask me when was the last bad Daniel Day-Lewis performance. You said, what was the last bad Daniel Day-Lewis film? And I'll go nine. But man, his, I mean, his filmography is amazing. And look, remember we were talking about, he's done two films in the past seven years. Two films in the past seven years. He did Lincoln and he did Phantom Thread. Before that, he did Nine in 2009. Then it was two years before that that he did There Will Be Blood. 
Then it was a couple of years before that that he did The Ballad of Jack and Rose. Then all the way back in 2003, he did Abbey Singer. And it wasn't since 2002 that he did Gangs in New York. Like, you get a lot of actors that do two, three films a year. That's just a working actor, right? But he's done like one every three or four years, especially lately. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, damn, I don't want him to retire. I don't want Daniel Day-Lewis to retire. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, this next one comes to us from Siddharth Singh, who writes, What did you think of the Rebels finale? Well, th thank you for asking, but like I said, some, uh, the title of my video coming up is Why I Loved It and Hated It, but the video is going to go up in a little bit here, so just hold on just for a little while longer, and my video will go up, and I'll give all my thoughts. Look, I'll tell you this. Generally, I liked it, but there were things about it I loved but and things about it I hated, so you'll see what all those things are in just a second. Uh, Shriyas writes... Hey, Mr. Campia, besides Thor, what other MCU movie do you think is underrated and why? Uh, Iron Man 3, uh, Age of Ultron for me. What is your, also, what is your funniest childhood memory? Well, I'm just, I'll take the first question. Um, what do I think, aside from Thor, because Thor is the most underrated MCU film. I think it might be the most underrated comic book film ever. That and, and Man of Steel are the most underrated comic book movies ever. Thor is fantastic. The first Thor is bloody brilliant. Um, and the, the themes that director Kenneth Branagh brings out in that, the way he navigates the narrative in it, it's just a, I think it's a brilliant film. I remember I went to go see it in theaters seven times in the first nine days it was in theaters because I just, I couldn't get enough of it. I just had to keep watching it. But besides Thor, I'm going to go Captain America, the first Avenger. For whatever reason, when people put together their list of ranking the, the MCU films, for a lot of people, like Captain America, the first Avenger, comes down in like the bottom five for a lot of people. And to me, look, it's not a top three or four MCU film, don't get me wrong, but it's a, I think it's a terrific film. I think it's just a terrific film, especially as an origin story. And it's tough to really nail those origin stories. And I think they did a great job of it. So I think the most underrated MCU film is Captain America, the first Avenger. All right, let's move on now. The next one comes to us from Rodrigo Ramirez, who writes, In episode 7 and 8, how are the Resistance able to take on the entire First Order? I love the new movies, but this kind of bothers me. It's simple. They never did take on the entire First Order. There was never a moment where they took on the entire First Order. They were the Resistance. They were, they were a rebel gang. They did strike and withdraw kind of operations. Hold on a second here. Oh, I lost something. They do strike and withdraw. They do hit and withdraw missions. They, they never once had their 60 or 70 ships versus the 18,000 ships of the First Order. They've never done that. The First Order is spread across the galaxy. So they picked and, ch and cho chose their targets, hit and go. And that's it. They never took on the First Order in their entirety. So that, that's, how, pardon me, that's how I would answer that question. Um, ben Rayner writes... In Face Off, who's better? John as Nick or Nick as John? For me, it's John as Nick. It's it's a wash for me. It's totally a wash for me. I've had that question asked to me a lot over the years. And for those of you who weren't around for the John Campion show this morning, the topic of one of my favorite guilty pleasure movies, Face Off, with Nick Cage and John Travolta came up. I love that movie. Uh, it's funny because me and uh, Migdalia brought that up on the show the other day. One of my all-time favorite quotes Excuse me, if I asked you to, uh, no, let me rephrase. If I let you suck my tongue, would you be grateful? And the way Nick Cage delivers that line is just great. For me, which one is better? It's a total wash. They both did such a great job of playing their characters at first and then mimicking each other's performance as those characters. They both did such a terrific job in that movie doing that. It's just, one, like I said, one of my absolute favorite guilty pleasure movies. Just behind, a couple of steps behind like Armageddon for me. I absolutely love that movie. But again, for me, between which is better, I'm going to call it a draw. I'm going to call it a wash. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Yavish Saini writes... Why it's not legal for Disney to buy DC as well? Well, first of all, nobody said Disney couldn't buy DC. Warner Brothers owns DC, though, and Warner Brothers is not interested in selling DC. DC, despite the state they're in right now, 
DC, they know, can be an extremely valuable property. Billions and billions and billions in property. Could Warner Brothers, if they wanted to, sell DC, which is just an IP property, it's not a company anymore, it's an IP property more than anything else now. If Warner Brothers wanted to sell DC to Marvel, or to Disney, I should say, I think there's theoretically a way that could happen. Now, the one thing that could come up in the way is that, hey, Marvel and DC are the two prominent comic book companies. To have them merge together creates an anti-competitive field for all the other smaller comic book publishing companies. That could be seen as a monopoly. And the government could step in and challenge that happening. So that's possible. Marvel, though, could buy DC and keep operating it as a separate company, all that kind of stuff. But, but all of it, all of that's moot because Warner Brothers is not going to sell DC. Time Warner may sell Warner Brothers, but Warner Brothers isn't going to sell DC. Well, then why doesn't Disney just buy Warner Brothers? Again, now you get into a larger scale situation where the government may claim that that's forming a monopoly and may be anti-competitive <clears throat> at that point. So there are possibilities of it happening. But even those possibilities are unrealistic because Warner Brothers would never sell them. But then there are legal hurdles to get over the way. And it's all about the government trying to make sure that there aren't anti-competitive things that get into play, that we don't get monopolies forming because that's bad for consumers and all that kind of stuff. So that's why it would be challenging. But again, it's all moot because there's no way Warner Brothers would ever sell DC. At least I don't think they would. I think they'd be crazy to, and I think they know that. Um, Adelia Chamberlain writes... Which is canon? Batman versus Superman theatrical or ultimate cut? Well, considering neither of them contradict each other, like nothing in the ultimate cut contradicts anything that's in the theatrical cut. Nothing in the ultimate cut contradicts the theatrical cut. Um, and since that's the case, they're both canon, I guess. In as much that, you know, the DC Cinematic Universe has canon... It's both of them can be considered canon because there's nothing contradictory in them. As far as I can remember off the top of my head, but at the top of my head, like unless the ultimate cut had Superman winning the fight against Batman, then you've got a contradiction. But the ultimate cut only introduces new material, nothing that contradicts the old material. So yeah, um, there. I think you can safely call them both canon. But remember, canon doesn't mean as much in the DCU as, say, it does with Star Wars, or at least as it's supposed to do with Star Wars, but we know how that's been going lately. All right, uh, Sarah O.D. writes, I watched your video about 10 anticipated movies, and if I am not mistaken, you didn't talk about Tomb Raider or Jurassic Fallen Kingdom. You are not excited for these movies? Well, here's the thing, Sarah. This is always the catch about talking about most anticipated. There are a lot of movies I'm looking forward to this year. They just, but you know, it's a top 10. That means I can only fit 10 in. There's probably a good 30, 40, maybe 45 movies this year out of the 500 that are coming that I'm, that I'm excited about and I'm really looking forward to, but the list is 10. So just because a movie wasn't on my top 10 list doesn't mean I'm not excited about them. It's just that I'm more excited about these other ones. Yes, I am excited about Fallen Kingdom. Tomb Raider, I'm curious about. I'm looking forward to it, but the trailers have really not done anything for me. So I'm a little bit worried about Tomb Raider, but still, I'm looking forward to it. I am. I am excited about Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, but it was a top 10 list. Just because something doesn't get in my top 10 does not mean I'm spitting on it. It doesn't mean I'm not excited about it. It's just mean that I'm not as excited about it as I am about those other ones. That's, that's all. So yes, I am looking forward to those. Um... Andre D writes, Roseman Pike born to play Amy in Gone Girl. Uh, no, I don't think so. But she was spectacular. Could have, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, could have won an Oscar for that. I mean, could have won an Oscar for that. She was so good in that. I, I do believe it was the defining performance of her career. I think it's probably the finest performance that she's had, but I think she will do better. I think she'll have even better before it's all said and done. Uh, she was just in uh, Hostels with uh, Christian Bale uh, as well. And she was terrific in that as well. So I don't know if that'll say it was, she was born to play that role, but it was definitely a defining role for her. Absolutely it was. 
All right, got a few left here. Derek Triviz writes, uh, talk about the new Supernatural already. Jeez. Oh yeah, so I did, uh, I think I'm caught up. Yes, I'm caught up on Supernatural. Um, I'm liking this season a lot. I, I, I'm liking the Jack character. When last season ended, I didn't know if I would dig this whole Ephilim thing that they were doing. But I gotta say, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the two different worlds aspect of it. Uh, I'm liking what they're doing with Lucifer. I'm liking what they're doing. Um, I've even, I like Donatello. So anytime they bring Donatello back is always good. Uh, I'm enjoying it. So I don't, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and go into a full blown 15 minute review of it or anything like that, but I did like the last episode, that whole thing with Jack taking the angels and just smoking the angels. I mean, that was great. And I'm really looking forward to Jack facing Michael. I don't want to see Lucifer fight Michael. I want to see Jack fighting Michael. As a matter of fact, I want to see Jack fight Michael and Lucifer at the same time. So I'm, I'm digging it. I'm digging it a great deal. Uh, <coughs> let's see here. John Reed writes, uh, hi, John from Liverpool. Hello, John. What's the most iconic ship, not from Star Wars or Star Trek? Ooh, well, I think Battlestar Galactica. <coughs> so yeah. Yeah, I think I, I would go with the Battlestar Galactica. Um, then you've got the Firefly, uh, the Serenity, I should say, which is a Firefly class ship. Um, but yeah, I think you got to go with Battlestar Galactica. And even below that is another ship from Battlestar Galactica, which would be the Vipers, the the individual fighters. The Vipers are great. What would be another one? Um, the ship from uh, 2001 is pretty iconic. Um but yeah, yeah, I'm going to stick with Battlestar Galactica. Uh, let's see. Next one comes to us from, where'd he go? Where'd he go? Uh-oh, uh where'd he go? Okay, Benny. <laughs> Benny writes, hey, John, uh, Patreon supporter here. Oh, thank you so much, Benny, for being a Patreon supporter. Uh, my question is, how do directors or casting agents know if actors have chemistry, i.e. Thor and Loki, Chris and Tom, or is it by luck chance that they work well together? Well, quite often... When they come down, when they, they're, they're narrowing it down to who they want in the different roles, what they'll do is they'll often pair them up, bring them in and do reads together. But the reality is there's no 100% way to know for sure until you get on set and actually start shooting the movie. But what they do, like I said, let's say they already know um, I'm going to play the lead role, okay? And they get... Uh, a couple of other people that might play the partner. Well, what they'll do is they'll bring the, once they narrow it down to those couple of people, they'll bring each of them in one at a time to do a reads with me with a couple of scenes just to see what kind of chemistry we play off each other. So that's how they do it. But again, there's no 100% way to know anything's going to work until you start shooting the movie and start looking at the dailies. I mean, it's, it's every, it's always a bit of a risk. It's always a gamble. Like it's the same as the true of uh, screenplays. Like screenplays, you can think it's a great screenplay. You read it and it re works good, but you just, you never know if it's going to work till you start shooting it and then start looking at the footage that you shot. That's, that's the only time you start realizing whether or not it really worked. So even for the casting people, it's always a little bit of roll of the dice. You do the best that you can, get the best people that you can, pair them up that you think will be the best fit, and then just keep your fingers crossed once they get in front of the camera and it starts rolling. That's just kind of the way it is. It's always an element of a gamble. Uh, Justin Ward writes, info on potential Warner Brothers slash AT&T Fox slash Disney mergers. Look, uh, all we've got right now is that the government is has sued Warner Brothers and AT&T to try to stop that merger. The government doesn't want that merger. They're challenging it in court. There is a good 70% chance that merger will not be allowed to happen. Uh, with Warner Brothers and AT&T. Once they get done with that, whichever way it goes, they'll probably then turn more of their attention to the Fox Disney deal. So we're still a we're still over a year away, at least minimum over a year away before we find out really where the government's going to fall on this. And then let's say if the government decides they want to challenge it, then we could be another year or two after that. So don't really know where things are right now. It looks like things are going to go against Warner Brothers and AT&T, but that's not a certainty yet. As far as the Fox Disney deal, we'll just have to wait until that one gets cleared up, I think, to really get a better idea about how that's all going to unfold. All right. Next one comes to us from Walden. And Walden writes, hey, John, love your shows. Thank you so much, Walden. I know you can't reveal it just yet, but yes or no, 
Uh, has anyone guessed correctly with the DCEU news? Not addressing it. Not addressing that at all. Uh, Joshua Gale writes, uh, Curious, what childhood thing or place do you always visit or do when you go home? For me, it's climbing a small hill by my grams in north northern Vermont. I have... Um, I'm going to get really personal here. I have a place I go almost, almost every visit back home. The name of my company, for those of you who don't know, because I started my own business and everything here, the name of my business, the actual name of the company that owns the John Campia show, this business that I created and that I incorporated is called Carson Drive Media. Carson Drive is the name of the street that I grew up on in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I grew up in on Carson Drive at a little house called 56 Carson Drive is where I grew up. And right down the street on Carson Drive was a park called Carson Park, where there was this, not impressive at all, little jungle gym. But when you were younger, like me, it seemed like a big deal. But I remember even as a teenager, I would often go walking by myself at night and just go to that jungle gym in Carson Park and sit down and just think. Um... Sometimes, you know, I think I'd pray, I I do whatever. I did a lot of my soul searching through my teenage years at Carson Park. And so when I go back home, what I try to do, it's been a little bit tricky lately because I've usually only gone home in the winters and it's tough to go to a park in the winter. But when I try to, when I go home, I usually try to, you know, get by myself and go to Carson Park and sit on that jungle gym. And, uh, just thinking about life and the decisions I've made that have led me to where I am. And it's funny because every time I go to that jungle gym, I'm at a different place in my life. I'm always at a different place in my life when I go to that jungle gym and I'm getting emotional thinking about it. And then I, you know, I look at the past and I look about where I'm going with my future and I still do it. The other thing I always do when I'm in Hamilton is go to this, my, one of my favorite restaurants in the world is called Chicago style pizza shack in Hamilton, Ontario. It's on upper Sherman best pizza in the world. Love it. I go there every day and and it's from scratch Italian cuisine that literally has three little old lady Italian grandmothers work in the kitchen making this shit from scratch. And it is some of the best Italian food you're going to get. That's not at my actual grandmother's house. So that's what I like to do when I go home. Thanks a lot for the question, man. Uh, Kellex writes, Saw the cutting edge. Oh, cutting edge. Yes. Saw the cutting edge for the first time last night and thought it was great. Was cheesy at times, but was a lot of fun. And both leads had great energy. Speaking of Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, that scene uh, at the opening, when they're, uh, when the whole skating competition is at the opening and it's in that big stadium, that's actually at a arena called Cops Coliseum in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And actually one of my dearest lifelong friends, her name's Diane. And I was actually the best man in Diane's wedding because she talked her uh, fiance who she had met, met after she had moved to the States. And she talked to her fiance into letting me be the best man, even though the fiance didn't know me. And she, I got to be the best man in her wedding, which was one of the best things ever. But anyway, my friend Diane, her and her sister have a close up of them. If you watch the opening scene of like a cutting edge and there's in the arena, there's one camera shot goes to the crowd where it's a close up of two people in the crowd, two girls going USA, USA, even though it was in Canada. That's my friend, Diane. That's my friend, Diane. And you're right. It, it's a, it's a fun little movie. It doesn't get any credit these days. But yeah, Cutting Edge was a great little film. Um, the Bandicoot Brawler writes, I love that name. That's a great name. Uh, hey, John, any news on How to Train Your Dragon 3? Love the first one and thought the second one was even better. Yeah, I think there's an argument to be made that the second one was even better than the first. Uh, I really like that film a whole hell of a lot. I think there was arguments to be made that it could have been considered for best animated picture of the year. It's wonderful. I get choked up with any movies that have real hard themes of fathers and sons. And the How to Train Your Dragon series definitely does that. It's one of the reasons why I like the first Thor movie so much is that it's so, um, uh, it's so zeroes in on the relationship of fathers and sons. And that's what I get a kick out of that. As of right now, no, I've heard that they have plans to do another one. I've heard that the plan is to do another How to Train Your Dragon. I, at this point, I don't know anything else about it though. So as soon as I hear anything, you guys will definitely, uh, definitely know first because I am looking forward to it. 
and uh, oh, uh, uh, King Leonidas from Sparta, Gerard Butler doing the voice of the dad is terrific. So I'm down for that new one, but I haven't got any news about the new one yet at this point, but let's keep our ears open. Uh, Steven Meisel writes, what's the best romance in a comic book movie? Um, you know what? A, an honorable mention goes to Tony and Pepper. I love the Tony Pepper stuff. And cause you know me, I don't like romancing my comic book movies, but the Tony and Pepper Potts stuff, the chemistry between think whatever you want about Robert Downey Jr. and Gwyneth Paltrow or whatever, but the chemistry between those two as Tony and Pepper is awesome. I love the chemistry between those two, but honestly, my favorite romance is the Andrew Garfield, uh, Spider-Man movies, uh, Andrew, him and Gwen, Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone. To me, that's the best romance. I, I mean, it, it felt charming. It felt romantic. It felt like a love story and it was done really, really well. And then, well, then of course you got to mention Deadpool, happy women's day. Um, but yeah, I think my Andrew Garfield and, uh, Emma Stone is my, is my, probably my pick for that. All right. Uh, Andrew Darrington just sends in a super chat from Australia. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, Luna comics writes, Hey John, why doesn't the movie community see movies as people see food? No, no pure garbage, no pure gems, just that solely rely on taste. Plus for not seeing movies subjectively, does that make the movie community toxic? Well, I think here's the thing. I, number one, completely agree with your assessment, Luna, that we should understand that movies is like food. No matter, you may love Beef Wellington, but somebody else may try it and it does not work for them. Like it doesn't work with their taste buds. It doesn't mean they have bad taste. It doesn't mean you have bad taste. It just means it's a unique experience for everybody. And when you try some, it's going to work for you. Some dishes will work for the vast majority of people and some won't. And that's just the understanding of it. I also don't think a lack of understanding of the subjectivity of film is the same as toxic fandom, but I do believe that the lack of understanding that all film is subjective is the root of what turns into a toxic fandom. Because if you look at any toxic fandom in the movie community and you follow it to its base, it all starts with a principle that somebody doesn't get. And they just don't get that just because you like something doesn't mean somebody else has to. And that doesn't make them right and you wrong or vice versa. It just means you saw it and experienced the movie differently than another person does. And if we understand that, toxic film fandom goes away. Because there's nothing to be toxic about anymore. If you just understand and truly grasp the notion that I love this movie, I think it's the best movie ever. You didn't like it? Ah, oh, that sucks. I wish you did. You're crazy, man. This movie's great, but you didn't. Oh, well, that's too bad. Like, I really wish you did. Here's why it worked for me. I wish it worked for you. I'll try to understand why it didn't work for you, but hey, that's cool. We're all film fans together. I'm going to keep loving this. Instead, what you get is people who are so weak-minded that, well, I love this movie, if that person says they don't, that undermines my love for the movie, so I have to attack them. It's like, no, somebody else not liking a movie you like doesn't undermine your love for it. It doesn't undermine your position. It doesn't undermine your opinion. It just means they have a different opinion than you. I think if people really understood these toxic gutter holes, like these DC, these certain DC fan communities, there are a lot of very, very healthy DC fan communities, but these little gutter hole DC communities that are just toxic. They just spew hatred. You know, they hate you. They hate anything that's not DC. And if you're not enough on their side, like even if you're on their side, if you're not enough on their side, they'll start hating you, blah, blah, blah. It all stems from being too dumb to understand that all films are subjective. And if we get it, film fandom becomes a lot more fun for everybody. And I, I wish more people got that. So thanks for that observation, Luna. All right, I got time for just a couple more. Then we're going to wrap it up, guys. Obviously, since I'm wrapping it up here in the next uh, six or seven minutes, no more questions. By the way, guys, if I don't get to one of your questions that you've sent in, fear not. I will address it first on open mic tomorrow. Tomorrow, your questions will get answered first. So if I don't get around to your question, don't panic. It will come. All right. Chris Bradford writes, 
Not movie related, but I have to speak in front of a group of people and I'm very nervous. Any tips on how to overcome a fear of public speaking? It's really weird, Chris, because I have the opposite phobia. I have literally stood on a stage in front of 20,000 people and spoke. I've stood on stages of 5,000 people and spoke. Um, I, I'm, I'm right at home in front of a huge audience. I'm completely at home. However, I am terrified of speaking to one, two, or three people. I get self-conscious. I feel like I'm not good enough to speak to somebody, blah, blah, blah. The way I would suggest approaching it, and I don't know if this will work for you because your, your issue is a little bit different from my issues, but here's what I would suggest. When you're in front of a group, speak into the void. Just speak into the void. Don't look at, don't make eye contact with anybody. Constantly move your head back and forth in the room. I do that all the time. Move your head back and forth in the room. Never get eye contact with anybody. Always just look a half an inch above people's heads and speak into that emptiness. Just speak into that void. Stay focused on what you're talking about. Don't focus on who you're talking to. Focus on what you're talking about. Um, so that's really the best, and you know what, nothing helps you overcome the nervousness about anything than just doing it. So get in there, focus on the void, keep a laser sharp focus on what you're saying, not who you're saying it to, and avoid eye contact with people. Once you do it a couple times, you'll become more and more comfortable, then you'll be able to look people dead in the eye as you're communicating and talking. I can do that too now. Um, so yeah, that would be my recommendation. All right. Chris Martin writes, favorite Hugh Jackman film besides X-Men and Logan? Um, Real Steel is up there. Prisoners is up there. Um, uh, oh, what's the one he did with Ashley Judd and Greg Kinnear uh, about old cow, new cow? What's the name of that romantic comedy he did? I love that romantic comedy and I'm, for, I'm, I'm, I'm losing the name of it. You guys will mention it. There's a 30 second delay here, so I can't turn to the chat board and see it now, but... Um, that one is definitely great. I love that one. Uh, Les Mis. Les Mis um, is absolutely fantastic. Oh, uh, I'll go Les Mis. Oh, even though Prisoners is so good and Real Steel is so good, I'm going to go Les Mis. Les Mis will be the one. That's what I'm going to go with. Um, let's see. Uh, where do we get here? Gloomy Gods International Rock Music writes, what's your opinion on film piracy? I think it spread the film culture to people who wouldn't have money to see movies or theaters and DVD. No, uh, film piracy is wrong. There's just, there is no getting away, getting around that. You can try to come up with excuses about why it's okay. But at the bottom line, film piracy is this. Somebody invested time and money into making a product that was intended for sale. There is somebody, when you're talking about movies, who invested years of their life, hundreds of thousands or millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, blood, sweat, and tears, and they did it with the intention of selling it for people to take and consume. When you subvert that and say, Oh, I know you poured all this money and energy and everything into it to be sold, but I found a way to get around it and I'm just going to steal it. I'm just going to take it without paying for it. I know you made it with the intention of selling it and you invested all of this of yourself into it and all this money and all this kind of stuff, but I'm just going to take it. It's your thief. It's stealing. It just is. I know the cool thing is to go, no, man, nothing's wrong with piracy. Piracy doesn't actually hurt anything or anybody. I know that's the cool thing to say. So I'm not the cool guy. I'm the nerd. Sorry. It's stealing. It just is. You know, I remember like I was uh, working with John Schnepp when he was making his documentary, uh, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened? And look, I was there right beside him for years as he made that thing. I know how much blood, sweat, tears, his own personal money, how many sleepless nights, how many credit cards he maxed out, all that kind of stuff to make that movie with the intention of selling it and trying to reap a benefit from it. Number one, just trying to break even with it, but then maybe reap a reward for it. You, you work for years on something hoping to reap a reward. And then finding out how many people pirated it, that just devastated him. It devastated him. 
It's like, why would people steal from me? And you can try to come up with all these excuses about and try to rationalize it all you want. But at the end of the day, somebody made something that took years of development, blood, sweat, tears, and money for the purpose of selling it, and you snuck around the back door and took it for free. That makes it that makes you a thief. It's it's stealing. Now, I also believe the MPAA in the way they're like they're trying to slap teenagers clicking a download link and trying to sue their parents for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay, that's bullshit. The MPA totally reacted wrong to the whole piracy thing. Uh, completely wrong. They went way overboard on it. No doubt about it. I am on the side of, I mean, I cannot take the MPAA side on that. They, they just reacted totally incorrectly about that. But that doesn't change the fact that piracy is still taking something that somebody else poured years, blood, sweat, and tears, tons of money and finances, and they made it for the purpose of sale, and you found a way to sneak around them like a little thief in the night and take it for free. There's, that's not okay. I'm not saying you're going to hell for that, but don't pretend or rationalize or come up with these excuses that no, really, it's okay. It, it doesn't deserve to have the MPA coming after you and trying to take your house. No, nothing like that. That's ridiculous. The way the MPA dealt with piracy is so stupid and so draconic and just so, like, just absolutely ridiculous the way they did it. And I, I contend that the way the MPAA tried to deal with piracy only encouraged more people to pirate. That's the stupid thing about how the MPAA was dealing with piracy. They just encouraged more people to do more piracy. So I am not behind them at all. I do not take their side in the least. But if you're going to ask me straight out and you're going to put the question to me, what is my opinion on piracy? That is my opinion on piracy. It's, it's stealing. It is. I don't think you should deserve to go to jail for it. I don't believe you should pay a fine of $100,000 for it. Um, but but yeah, it's is, is it right or is it wrong? It's wrong. And anything else is just coming up with excuses. It's just making up scenarios that don't really exist to try to justify the act of stealing. But it, it, to me, it is stealing. So you asked, so I gave you my answer on that. Um, all right, guys, that will do it for me for this installment of Open Mic. Thanks so much for joining me here for today. Don't forget, guys, Open Mic now moves to 2 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Instead of 3, we're bumping it up uh, an hour earlier for going out. And once again, for those of you who sent in, there was I still about 8 or 9 questions there. For those of you who sent in questions that didn't get answered, don't you worry. I'm going to take all those questions, save them to a document, and those will be the first questions that get answered on tomorrow's episode of Open Mic. Hey guys, listen, thanks so much for being here today and joining me. I appreciate a great deal. I know there's tons of different things you could be doing with your day today, and I know I say some things that you guys disagree with. Maybe it's about which is your favorite Logan movie. Maybe the things I said about piracy you disagree with. That's the great thing about this medium is that we can have these discussions and disagree and why you guys got to voice your opinions as well in a respectful way of course by jumping down in the comment section and leaving your thoughts hey guys don't forget you can follow me on social media on twitter if you're not following me already why not follow me on twitter simply at john campia email in um oops not that one that's the wrong card sorry about that uh, anyway guys that will do it for me thanks a lot for joining me my name's john campia and until my next video bye bye